and welcome back to another episode of Security Insights, where best practices of cybersecurity meet real-world workplace. I'm Chris Gettle, and joining me again is Robert Waters from our solutions marketing team. Robert, welcome back. Thanks, Chris. Excited to be here and excited to cover today's topic. On this episode, we're going to take a look at the cost associated with a couple types of cyber attacks, some of the underlying causes that allow for such attacks to occur, and how to counter those causes in a proactive manner so that one, organizations spend less time firefighting, and two, they can ideally avoid some of the costs that we'll be discussing. So, Diving right in on those costs, first up is data breaches. Chris, do you have any educated guess on the average cost of a data breach? Uh, they've been going up steadily over the years, so I, I would I would expect we've got to be getting close to the $5 million mark for the overall cost of a, a data breach incident. You got it, and that's why I specifically asked for an educated guess, because I know you're, you're pretty educated on this topic. It was more of a... Uh, Test of your memory, then. But you're spot on. So, according to the recently released 2024 IBM Cost of a Data Breach report, the global average cost of a data breach has increased 10% since just the past year. It now sits at 4.88 million US dollars, almost 5 million. And that figure represents the sum of costs associated with detection and escalation, notification of data subjects data protection regulators, and other third parties, Uh, post-breach response activities, which largely include communicating with and compensating the victims of the breach, and then lost business. And, you know, $5 million is a pretty hefty sum, especially when you're not expecting it. So, Chris, what do you make of this amount? Yeah, I I think there's, there's definitely a lot of challenges that companies face. The tools and capabilities of threat actors have increased. So you've got uh, somebody who's able to persist an attack longer, do a more damaging attack. The combination of um, the initial, especially if you're dealing with ransomware, the initial uh, kind of compromise of the system, ransoming the systems and making them unavailable, exfiltration of data and that extra leverage that they hold when trying to ransom that uh, data back to you. There's just a lot more pressure on organizations and a lot uh, it, it impacts overall with a lot more need to uh, bring the right uh, additional services involved um, into negotiations and determining who the threat actor is, negotiating with them, interactions there are going up in costs. Um, the actual event itself can oftentimes be um, a huge impact on that cost, bringing in the right uh, support to be able to get out of that um, usually involves third-party um, security uh, uh, expertise that uh, the company doesn't have itself. So all of those things add up very easily into the cost of that data breach. And like you said, the post-breach response activities, a lot of organizations have improved their abilities in those areas, either direct or directly in-house or um, with uh, you know putting uh, uh, certain services in place uh, with different vendors to be able to handle the PR and outreach that occurs after an incident like that. So all of those things do accumulate more costs overall, which uh, easily drive up that average cost of a breach. Spot on. There's a lot that goes into the response. It's not just, oh, we've been breached. Quick, fix it, and and, and let's get it moving on. It's, it's a lot more. It's crisis control. It's PR. It's all those things. And during your answer there, you mentioned the term ransomware a couple of times. So let's move on quickly and talk about ransomware. So for that, we look to Covware's latest quarterly ransomware report, where we see the median ransom payment in Q2 2024 was 170,000 US dollars, and the average ransom payment was 391,015 dollars. Though what I found to be more interesting is that Covware's findings which date back about five years, show that ransom payments have steadily increased over time. But the percentage of organizations that actually make those ransom payments has steadily decreased from a high of 85% in Q1 2019 down to just 36% in Q2 24, or Q2 2024, if you will. 
Chris, any thoughts on what's driving this dip where two thirds of organizations aren't paying ransoms today? Yeah, I think a lot of times we see large spikes in the 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 amount of payments that are going out. Um, it it comes in uh, a lot of the times where the tactics of threat actors have changed, and the market is trying to adjust and keep up to it. Um, so the the spike that we saw over like the previous you know year and a half, almost two years, was in in part due to the the exfiltration and additional ransoming of that data that uh, not just, you know, making it unavailable to you, but actually stealing that data and threatening to use it elsewhere. So I think that had increased the number of companies' willingness to pay. Then you had the combination of um, through COVID, through a lot of time periods, there were uh, there was a lot of resource shortages. There were a lot of uh, skill set shortages. Uh, having the right staff in place, the right tools, the right processes in place to respond to a security incident like this also had a direct impact on the number of companies that, uh, you know, likely were, were paying out for a while there. Um, so as companies improved on many of those things, that probably helped to reduce the number of them that were um, paying out over time. There's also regulatory impacts. So Putting more of these threat actors onto lists where they're basically banned, you can't uh, you can't pay that ransom to them. So certain threat actors are bankrolling nation states' activity, or by they're bankrolled by nation states, and they're basically a form of revenue for that country. North Korea is a really good example. Um, their missile program is paid for fifty percent of that program is paid for out of ransomware and cryptocurrency theft. Um, so these are these are big activities that are driving, uh, you know, nation state level activities. So of course there's going to be regulations and restrictions around a lot of that as well. As those things happen, the number of payments you can make to threat actors who are known to be driving money into those types of uh, governments uh, offsets that as well. Uh, so there's a number of things that uh, kind of. Uh, go back and forth to drive the number of payments out versus uh, um, increasing or decreasing over time. I do think we're at an extreme lull, but yes, the average payment though has gone up a bit. So it's kind of, there's still a lot of money going out, just a matter of the number of overall payments has shrunk in the past uh, probably two quarters here. Right. And I wonder if that's sort of a an issue of supply and demand on the threat actor side, because Less companies are paying, so they have to ask for more money from the ones that will pay. That well, that is a that is an interesting angle as well. So the threat actors, um, you know, some of these groups get broken up after a while. Um, the ones that aren't directly nation state funded, oftentimes those crime rings are, you know, they they may have members of that group get uh, compromised, and uh, that group will be broken up, and that if they disperse into um, possibly new groups or get consumed by other threat actors. And uh, it just kind of changes the landscape of who's out there. The number of active threat actors will fluctuate from time to time, but that has also gone down a little bit um, in, you know, in the last uh, couple of quarters. So uh, in general, um, that can definitely play a, another factor on how much or how many ransoms are being paid. Definitely. I think, you know, no matter how many there are, they're not going away. They're always going to be there. So you need to protect yourself, protect your organization against these threat actors. So let's now move on and talk a bit about that. So now that we've confirmed the well-known fact that cyber attacks can be costly, let's discuss how organizations might be able to avoid those costs by examining some of the conditions that make them more prone to attack, plus how they can proactively counter those conditions to improve their security postures. And first up is a hot topic today. That's attack surface expansion. It's no secret that attack surfaces seem to constantly grow in complexity and size, giving attackers a greater volume and variety of entry points into an organization's network. Chris, what would you say are some of the ways that organizations can combat this expansion? Yeah, so there's, there's, right now there's five attack surfaces that we really need to worry about. The most common and traditionally thought of is the, you know, your internal infrastructure. So that's 
your vulnerability scanners are scanning servers, workstations, whatever, to find out what vo software vulnerabilities are exposed within your environment. So that's that first attack surface is that internal infrastructure. The second one is one that threat actors are very actively looking at on a regular basis. That's your public facing attack surface. Um, so getting the perspective of both your internal and that public facing attack surface gives you visibility into that software vulnerability perspective across your environment. There's cloud configuration now has become another attack surface. So you've got, you may have things running in Azure, in AWS, in all site types of different cloud environments, how those are configured. Um, you know, where you have data residing, other things like that are definitely an attack surface. Um, and then there's data itself is another attack surface and users. So each of those five kind of present a variety of different risks to your business. The two that we're talking about specifically here, that internal infrastructure and that external infrastructure are definitely two that um, are uh, probably the two easiest to tackle and uh, really help organizations to get a, a handle on a good portion of what's at risk. Now, if one of those gets exposed, that exposes that data um, attack surface much more uh, easily. Um, so a lot of times you're, you're looking to see how can you reduce the risk in one area to reduce risk even further in another. Um, from that Internal infrastructure, many of you probably have tools like a vulnerability scanner already, but that external attack uh, surface is definitely one that a lot of organizations don't have something in place today. Yes, you do get some perspective on, you know, what uh, vulnerabilities might be on servers that are running something that's external facing, but you don't get the perspective of it from that outside in approach unless you have the right tools in place. And that's where you get into um, an enterprise attack service management solution. Uh, this would be a solution that has the ability to, you know, you can feed it a number of domains or uh, subdomains or different services like that. And it's able to go out and look at that and find all the things that are publicly discoverable within those areas. And with that, you can start to see what an attacker does. Keep in mind, one of the most important stages of any type of attack, data breach, ransomware attack, whatever, is that reconnaissance step. Threat actors have very, very powerful tools in being able to discover what's in your environment. If they um, you know, are looking at that external view to find an entry point, or if they compromise a user and get onto a single device within your environment, they're going to start to look at the different things that they can detect in your environment. So discovery, that's kind of a foundational piece. But that ability to augment your vulnerability scanning with an external uh, assessment as well, using an ASM or EASM solution, is ideal. That way you get basically both sides of that coin, the internal and the external view. 100%. And I'll add to that, you know, on the topic of external attack surface management, like you mentioned, it's pulling public data about your external facing attack surface. and. Because it's public data, you can look beyond your own attack surface of your own organization and conduct risk assessments on third parties. So that could be an existing or prospective partner, supplier, perhaps a subsidiary or an acquisition. You can you know, determine what risk they may be presenting to you uh, in this increasingly interconnected world, if you will, not just looking at yourself, but also looking at these other organizations that you integrate your systems with. Moving along from there, next up in our discussion of conditions that make organizations more susceptible to attack and ways to counter those conditions is prioritization. At this point, it's been well documented in countless blog posts and research reports from analysts and vendors alike that CVSS, Common Vulnerability Scoring System, despite its popularity, isn't the answer when it comes to prioritizing vulnerabilities and other exposures for remediation. And that's fair because that was never really its original purpose. So, Chris, if it's not CVSS, what is the answer? Well, so there's, there's a, a variety of different tiers to this, but basically getting some other type of risk prioritization in the mix is required. 
That may come with just getting a prioritized list of the vulnerabilities that are actively being targeted. So you can prioritize things outside of CVSS and vendor severity alone to, to better kind of refine your prioritization to find the most risky things first. Um, a good example of a free solution to do that is the CISA KEV list or Node Exploited Vulnerabilities list. Uh, so the uh, uh, U.S. federal government and any other organizations that are under that umbrella of the DOD and CISA are mandated to resolve certain vulnerabilities within a specific time frame. And the reason that CISA was mandated to start this list was really to focus the uh, uh, government entities on reducing risk across their environment. And, and a lot, a big part of that, again, comes from that failing of CVSS and vendor severities to properly give us a good risk indication of that. So you could score something from a, a raw kind of, uh, you know, you know, complexity perspective, um, integrity, uh, the different elements that make up CVSS scoring. It doesn't really matter as much anymore. Threat actors have gotten much more sophisticated. They don't um, just focus on the easy, low-hanging fruit, um, you know, uh, highly available type of vulnerabilities. They're getting into a lot more obscure vulnerabilities and vulnerabilities that take a bit more effort to exploit. And a lot of times they're using them in combination. They're chaining vulnerabilities together to exploit and meet their needs. Most of the vulnerabilities that we deal with are not critical. They're not a high CVSS score. Um, you know, in August, uh, the August Patch Tuesday, let's take that as an example. Microsoft resolved six zero-day vulnerabilities. None of those were rated as critical. Five of them were important. One of them was a moderate from a vendor severity perspective. From a CVSS scoring perspective, we had everything from a 6.5 CVSS score for that moderate up to, I think, the highest of the actively exploited this month was 8.8 .8 CVS or for a CVSS score. So that one might have gotten on your radar, even though Microsoft said it was only rated as important. Um, but overall, the, the scoring there is static in its nature. It doesn't take into account other aspects. The fact that that moderate vendor uh, severity CVE was being actively exploited it had a CVSS score of 6.5. All those things really pushed it down so that I wasn't even paying attention to it, but it's actively being exploited. So I should be treating it as a higher priority. So CISA's KEV list added all six of those vulnerabilities immediately on Patch Tuesday and set a date of uh, mandating that they get remediated by September 3rd. So all of those organizations that are mandated by CISA need to go and remediate those in a timely fashion. All of that is a risk-based prioritization method. Now, that's just taking a list and feeding it into my vulnerability scanning and patch management solutions. But there's a lot more vulnerabilities that have been targeted than just the ones that are on CSIS KEV list. That's consider it the, the nastiest of them, the tip of the iceberg, the ones that you really need to worry about the most. But if you take um, a, a full risk-based vulnerability management platform, this is getting up into paid-for tools that are purpose-built to help solve these problems. So aggregating multiple vulnerability sources. CSIS KEV list, you have to go figure out how to detect and remediate those things on your own. They're just giving you a list of prioritized items. An RBVM solution lets you take multiple feeds and push them all into a place where you can start to refine and manage the vulnerabilities across your environment. One thing that's been happening quite a bit, we're talking to a number of organizations that are starting to run what they were using for vulnerability scanning in many areas, but they're starting to shift over to Microsoft Defender for vulnerability scanning across those Microsoft endpoints, especially. With uh, additions of things like an ES EASM solution into your environment, you could be running now upwards of three different vulnerability sources. How are you getting visibility across all of those? So, another part of that risk-based vulnerability management platform is aggregating all of those different sources into a single funnel where you can then get that more robust prioritization. The number of vulnerabilities that it has visibility around is a big difference as well. 
CISA is somewhere north of 1,100 vulnerabilities being tracked there right now. Um, our risk-based vulnerability management platform is currently tracking over 40,000 vulnerabilities that have a known exploit um, uh, or proof of concept code available for them. Um, so aggregating all that information together and pulling from many more vulnerability sources, I can not only get the the tip of the iceberg, but I can start working back to the next level of risk within there as well. Each step of the way, I'm reducing that risk to my environment. Spot on. Yeah, that CISA KEV list is always a great place to start, but you don't want to stop there because it's going to show you, you know, the worst of the worst in some instances, but there's a lot more that you need to worry about. So that having some sort of RBVM risk-based solution is, you know, tantamount in this day and age. Moving on, thus far we've touched on attack surface expansion and prioritization. Let's wrap things up with one more topic that usually doesn't get as much attention as the first two, and that's silos. And when I say silos, more specifically, I'm talking about siloed tools and siloed technology that lead to siloed data. How can organizations proactively combat these silos to improve their security postures and lessen the odds they're targeted in a cyber attack? Yeah, so I mentioned it a little bit already. There's there's a couple of different silo challenges that we have. Um, there's there's the um, the different technologies that we're using to assess different parts of our our infrastructure. I've got my internal vulnerability scanning, which may be one or more tools. I've got my external vulnerability scanning. I may have configuration vulnerability tools for the cloud side. I may have data or user uh, tools that are also looking at vulnerabilities there. How do we start to get a perspective across all those different um, uh, attack surfaces? If you're a large enterprise that has their own development teams as well, you probably also have different SAST or DAST or container scanning solutions within your development organizations. You may be doing pen tests. You might even have a purple team who's doing active pen tests on a regular basis. Um, All of these are sources of vulnerability data. Having those in different places creates uh, silos within the security visibility of your organization. So again, having an RBVM solution helps you to remove the silos in visibility and get everything into one place. Now let's talk about a different type of silo. If we've been trying to optimize our business to execute more effectively, a lot of times we're pushing all of our proprietary data into areas where we can reduce data silos within our business. By doing that, how are we exposing ourselves to a broader risk by doing those types of activities? So there, you may have to look at how do you offset the risk of removing data silos within the operational side of your business by making sure you've got more robust access controls to get at those services and data. So there, we start to talk more about zero trust a SASE solution, um, basically getting basically getting deeper into secure access technologies to make sure that we're not just letting something in via VPN where they now have kind of open access to a large environment. This may involve um, segmenting of your network, segmenting of uh, um, access to different uh, applications so that somebody coming in only gets access to one very specific thing that they need. And with the increase of our remote workforce, that type of secure access becomes even more important. Very few of our employees are getting access from on-network now. When we're accessing cloud solutions, when we're accessing things remotely, we need to make sure that we're connecting users up to the specific things they need and giving them restricted access anywhere else. So in summation, silos. Good on farms, bad in cybersecurity. In, and for the that, most part, yes. yes. And, and with that corny joke, pun intended, I think we've uh, reached the end of our content for today. So I'll, I'll throw it right back to you to take us home. All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us here on another episode of Security Insights. As always, feel free to share the episode if you'd like what you heard. That helps uh, our viewership and makes more people aware of uh, you know the information that we're providing. We'll be back next month with an all-new cybersecurity topic, so be sure to subscribe and come back next time. Until then, stay safe.